Between being super busy myself and also having no information on Legends Arceus, we're back to talking about the Sinnoh remakes and all the scraps of news we've had for this unreasonably mysterious game throughout 2021. Let's break down why the Pokemon Company has been so silent since the announcement, why the response to the game so far has been so controversial, and why the news that we do have is pretty indicative of the direction that Ilka is heading with Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. Oh yeah, and uh, also this. To get why we know next to nothing about these games that they announced way back in February, it's better to run through all the stuff we do have first and foremost. Looking at the official website, their faithful reproductions of the original Diamond and Pearl story mean most of, if not all of the story elements from Pokemon Platinum aren't going to be present. Then goes on to say while newer players are going to have a lot of surprising moments, the people that played it when they were kids should expect familiar scenes. Nintendo's official website doubles down by saying that the Pokemon present are the ones from the original Diamond and Pearl games, meaning that we've got 493 to pick from with the expanded regional decks from Platinum seeming pretty unlikely. Some people took their headphones out during this part of my last video, so I guess it's worth expanding on. But a Porygon Z in the trailer doesn't mean anything when we know for a fact that Pokemon prototypes are filled with debug menus to instantly give you any Pokemon you want. They don't like record some guy at the office playing through the game with his team of Pokemon for trailer footage or whatever. But if we're going to be real outside of a pretty nebulous conveniences of the modern Pokemon series, we've got no idea what BDSP is going to add that the originals didn't already have. And I guess part of that is likely due to the guys that they've got making it. For the first time in the series history, we don't have Game Freak working on a mainline game, instead being a CG design company known as Ilka. Whilst all their previous work has been made up of games that they've been outsourced to provide assets to, the Sinnoh remakes are their first full games that they've ever made on their own with the only other involvement being Junichi Masada as the game's co-director and Shota Kageyama on the game's remixed music. Likely a recommendation from Masada after what happened with Let's Go. To better clarify, the job of a main director for a game is typically one that involves pulling the team together, allocating staff, and making sweeping changes that affect the whole project. You'd be forgiven for not knowing what Yuichi Ueda's last game was as a director because, uh, oh yeah, wow. But what's weird about this whole collaboration is that Ilka don't seem to be particularly aware that they're working on Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl at all. At the time of this video, not once have the Sinnoh remakes ever been mentioned on either of their still pretty active official social media platforms, not even around the time of the game's announcement. They don't even follow any Pokemon related accounts, and likewise aren't followed by anything Pokemon related either. Not even Masada. Feels kinda weird when he's the one co-directing the whole thing and only knows you Ueda personally. After seeing literally everything this company has put out whilst researching for this video, it's clear that they're pretty small and all about helping out with bigger productions. Combined with Masada's lack of public interaction with the team behind these remakes, and it's a wonder why they're behind these, all things considered, pretty important games in the first place. Even on their dedicated Ilka app website for the games that they develop, it's completely bare of anything Pokemon related. With the last main remakes, and Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire having several trailers and consistent announcements of new forms and characters every three or so weeks until its release. And Let's Go had Masada doing interviews with much of the dev team that was, at the time, the youngest staff to ever work on Pokemon. Despite having what seems to be a noticeable increase in production value with the gameplay seen in the Switch OLED trailer, yes I'm gonna talk about it, the western side of the brand doesn't even seem to be aware of how the game is progressing. You got Nintendo's Twitter and the eShop using outdated screenshots that directly contradict the marketing in your own console trailer that came out weeks before. It could be very possible that the footage used there was just some sort of CG mock-up for the Switch trailer given what Ilka seems to be very good at, but please I don't want to even imagine the fallout if that turns out to be true. I don't think that's going to be the case, but it would explain why Nintendo is just fine with actively making the game look outdated whenever they feel like posting about it. I suppose the big question is, well, what happened? The main logical conclusion that I can jump to is that there's a distinct lack of discussion internally when it comes to how these games are supposed to be developed and marketed. The company making them doesn't acknowledge them, the company publishing them has no idea what the games are supposed to look like, the company promoting them completely forgot that they existed, and the person that directed the original hasn't shown any public involvement or done interviews with the current team like he has with pretty much every single game in recent memory. Online, you'd think they're not struggling with development because despite COVID, everything seems business as usual. It was about May of this year being the first time where they had to fully go online and not once did they ever stop touring universities or hiring new people. And the company continues to proudly post about its most recent non sino games that they've played a part in. And most astoundingly, the recent June update for Pokemon Home. This is probably the most important one of all because it shows that they're not like banned from talking about Pokemon or anything. I actually kind of feel pretty bad for them. It's super obvious from this rollout that BDSP was thrown onto them in a rush after contributing to Home. To the point where they're making games that don't look to have too many changes from the original. And when you start seeing it from this perspective, this entire lack of news just makes sense. 
The Pokemon company are the ones that allocate much of their IP to everyone they partner with, so I can really only blame them for how this whole thing has panned out. There is a clear lack of confidence in how to market a game that, comparatively to other main Pokemon games, was outsourced so Game Freak could release another game just two months later. And the last five months have just been us seeing the lack of communication between those groups as a result of that outsourcing. It being the first time that they've outsourced anything like this to this extent, it makes sense that we've had no communication whatsoever. It's a shame too because from browsing Ilka's staff and their social media, they've clearly got a lot of talented individuals. I even spotted an ex-monolith artist in there. Only one person that I could find on the whole team has publicly acknowledged this game's existence. Which just goes to show that there's certainly a lack of confidence of the project from all sides of the brand. It's a confusing whirlwind of blatant miscommunication that nobody really feels comfortable addressing, and I can only hope that this video becomes outdated at some point in the future. Whilst I obviously don't expect them to be posting development spoilers, the silence of the team on social media is pretty deafening. And not at all like Game Freak staff that have typically been pretty vocal about their workdays on social media plenty of times before. The only other alternative is that they quite literally have nothing to show for what makes these remakes unique. I also don't think I need to explain why not showing anything on a game people have been pretty controversial for for like 5 months is a pretty bad move. And as I spent a whole video outlining last time, that's maybe just the worst possible outcome of all. I like to think that a game's box art is pretty indicative of what you're in for when playing the actual thing. But the core understanding outside of any basic design principles is that the illustrated art usually looks real fucking nice. So when I saw they announced the Legends Arceus box art, I was genuinely floored by how not Pokemon it looked while still retaining the gorgeous style the series is known for. Even if we don't have direct credits, I'm pretty confident that Megumi Mizutani was the artist here. The way she draws Pikachu and the general line work on dead giveaways. And she's managed to capture the ambitious open world vibe that game is trying to go for pretty effortlessly. I love the blue to red gradient that swells up at the top of Mount Coronet, and it also doesn't tirelessly feature yet another legendary Pokemon front and center. My absolute favorite in the series by a landslide. I guess that's what makes Ilka's attempt at the brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl box art stick out like a bit of a sore thumb by comparison. If the most recent remakes did a pretty good job of emphasizing what was new, then Ilka's one-to-one -one recreation lines up with that faithful approach they're taking to the game's development. An art director put this together intentionally, and it's not just a box art that sits on your shelf regardless of whether it looks good or not. It's an easy indicator of how they want the game to be portrayed in its boldest form. And if this doesn't spell out to you that it's a very safe remake, then I don't know what will. And whilst you're totally free to like them, there's some major construction issues that should explain why this box art has been so controversial. A lot of people are saying that they're more dynamic than the original, but that's really up for debate. By just tracing out their gestures, the BDSP models are somehow in less actionable poses than the 2D Sugimori art slapped onto a blank background. These designs don't look like they could feasibly move in a 3D space without levitating. They're just so stiff and rigid looking. Older examples of Palkia and Dialga in official art showcase a lot of curves which really drive the expression of force. This one from the TCG emphasizes how the waist pushes inwards, as it should, to accentuate the rest of the pose and especially the shoulders. Whereas Shining Pearl's whole body is just a straight line upwards that barely curves out and has no exaggeration. It almost feels like they were given a mandate on how the necks of these Pokemon shouldn't move when we know that's just not supposed to be the case. The composition is also flat as a pancake. They're trying to make the legendaries look powerful because the Pokemon are roaring outwards, but they still somehow feel tiny because you're not viewing them from below or to the side. And more so at an uncanny forward face and angle that makes the poses look goofy as hell. Like they're about to topple over. We know they can make Pokemon designs look cool or threatening from dynamic angles because, again, they've done it before. Both with previous box art and also Diaga and Palkia. These aren't like unworkable designs that were fundamentally broken. Plenty of pieces showcase some incredible foreshortening, good composition or otherwise strong gestures that sell the scale of these two dragons. I understand why they wouldn't want to make the cover art look too off model or even 2D, but there were just so many better ways to go about this. Stylistically, the way these models are rendered are also completely at odds with how the Pokemon look in the games, in the official art, and uh, also in the games. Wow, see how you guys kind of boned yourselves there, huh? Like I said last time, these games have a big problem with visual consistency that stopped being the case with Pokemon as the series progressed. Having the same design look like it came from four different art styles in one game feels like such a fundamental misunderstanding of why this was necessary back on the DS. It's also just not an honest representation of what the game looks like at all. 
Anyway, besides Diaga's foot turning purple because of how they just cropped the key art instead of making two separate renders, or the fact that Palkia's wings are barely visible, the covers for BDSP have a lot of weird inconsistencies that got people talking. I want to make it very clear that a lot of these are very minor nitpicks and the original wasn't like this work of art outside of Sugimori's contributions, but I thought that we were already aware that 3D just ages far worse than 2D over time when it comes to video games. Don't worry, I don't think it's going to be like Tekken 1 levels of bad in a few years, but I don't think time is going to be kind to it all the same especially when Legends Arceus seems to already have it beat. One thing you guys probably have been waiting to hear me talk about at length are the new visuals from the OLED Switch trailer, and on that I have to say, uh, not very much I guess. So early last month, Nintendo announced a brand new model for the Switch, and whilst it doesn't actually have anything hardware related to make games look better or run faster, a whole graphics overhaul was presented for Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl in about two seconds of gameplay compared to what we had seen previously. Oh, and also from that point onwards for some reason. What's funny is that they had stealth updated the eShop with some updated screenshots back in May, but the grass was an even more gross luminous green and I can't for the life of me understand why they thought that was a good idea. Thankfully, the OLED trailer completely fixed the colors, making them far more muted by baking in some earthy textures so they don't clash with the grass anymore. All of the rock and tree textures had also been redrawn to match the softer art direction as a result, and plenty of the background assets have also been shifted about. We saw a very similar thing happen with Let's Go, which according to the publicly released prototypes were changes made super late on in development, so this should be a good indicator of where this game actually is in terms of its cycle. If there's anything to take away from this video, the game is probably mostly complete minus the post game and debugging at around June. What's more is that they've completely overhauled the battle intro, so it's not a one to one of what we got in Diamond and Pearl. Lucas's model is far more detailed than it was previously, and even though I'm still not a fan of how it's constructed, the changes make a world of difference. He also actually rotates in on an axis now, which does wonders for making each encounter have a little bit of depth that it was sorely lacking. No blank blue screen encounter ripped right from Diamond and Pearl was something that I mentioned in my previous video, and uh, yeah, they fixed that. This went unheard in the last video, and it'll probably get ignored again this time around, but I really don't hate these games, just a little disappointed with the approach they seem to be going. Changes like this, though, do mean a lot, and really shows that Ilka are looking at feedback to try and improve the remakes. But what I do find pretty unfortunate is that many of my core issues that I've outlined previously still have yet to be fixed, even if the game does look leagues better in other aspects. In fact, seeing the UI be a really out of place one to one of the original text box just fills me with dread because no other remake has done this previously, and is again pretty indicative of what they're going for with this game. I'm all for improvements and don't misunderstand that OLED footage is a step in the right direction, but I desperately want to be proven wrong from this point onwards and seriously hope these last two videos don't age well. I hate being negative about this sort of thing, but between their really unconfident approach to promotion that stems from a lack of internal communication, or some questionable instances of design that people just can't agree on, it makes sense why much of the community still has reason to be worried about the Sinnoh remakes not living up to some very reasonable expectations. Thank you for all the support in my recent videos. You can support me on Patreon if you want to watch them much sooner.